Okay, I'm calling this video the uh, Enigma of Avalon Hills 1914. And the reason I'm calling it that is because I've had a strange uh, history with this game. Now to understand the video and where I'm going at, we have to look at the hobby in general in 1968 and where Avalon Hill was in 1968 because I think it's part and parcel of understanding this game and how it fits in the, uh, the canon of Avalon Hill games and where it fits in the hobby today. Okay, I've been going through back issues of the General Magazine, and this is the index from 64 to 1989. Now, the game itself came out in 1968. Now, I joined Wargaming in 1969. And looking at these back issues, I see that articles on 1914 appeared in six different issues of the General, and it generated 27 different articles. So there was a lot of interest in this game, and a lot of very interesting variations. Now the game did appear in the March-April 1968 version, so it was a major release for Avalon Hill. But the odd thing was that edition one, they only printed 126 copies, which is kind of weird when you think um, that's a pretty low print run. Almost as if they were releasing it as a bubble feeler to see if the game would catch on. Now, there was a rata for the edition number one, and there was even some rules changes, which came out right after edition number two. So, for any of you who have the, the first edition, you have one of one uh, 126 copies. That would be a very rare item indeed. But most of us who have the game have edition two, where they added the Belgium rules, which were absolutely essential. So, it was a cover game, and the year before uh, was uh, Jutland, the May June 1967. Both games are by Jim Dunnigan. Now, another little interesting fact about these early Avalon Hill games, I've noticed it in many others too. There are no designer credits anywhere to be seen. You've got your rules, it's literally a four page folder in those days, and uh, the Avalon Hill address, the copyright 1968. And even when you went to this uh, beautiful 1914 manual, which we're going to look at again later, there's no mention of the designer, Jim Dunnigan, which is um, interesting, showing you that in those days they weren't pushing the designer. The game is by Avalon Hill, and that's all there is to it. The designers were not pushed. Half the time you never knew who the designers of the games were. Now, over the years, I've collected quite a few of the Avalon Hill catalogs. They always seem to give you one with a game. And this is an early one from about, uh, again, oh, the date here, 1966. So, uh, it shows Guadalcanal, Blitzkrieg, Battle of Bulge, Midway. And, of course, we wouldn't expect to see 1914 in this little catalog, since it only came out in 68. But the odd thing is that in all the catalogs I have, 1914 does not appear anywhere. It's almost as if the game uh, fell through the cracks a bit. Couldn't have been a big smash hit for Avalon Hill. So that's a bit of a mystery. Now, it could be that I just don't have catalogs from that era, that's all. If anyone's got a catalog with 1914 uh, advertised in it, I'd love to see a scan of it. Now, what we're looking at here is a magazine. Uh, it was no cost. I don't even remember how I got my copy. It was a small magazine published by Avalon Hill to celebrate 25 years, their 25th anniversary. And it was a very, very good magazine. And this is where I got a lot of my information about 1914. There were some great articles showing Charles Roberts, really the father of our wargaming hobby. He started Avalon Hill. And uh, they show the Avalon Hill team in the early days. The only time that Avalon Hill ever did an advertisement on a billboard, and it was for the game Gettysburg, shows their early addresses of the company and history of their games. This is the building that I knew, uh, 4517 Harford Road. I actually drove down there in the 90s, I think, to go see the Avalon Hill Company. Uh, very good articles, and it gives a history of their games. Now, we'll just show you the general categories here. 
They call these the acquisition years, 1976, when Avalon Hill was expanding and buying titles. Now, these are the games that they call the collector's items, which is, I think that's the Gettysburg 64 edition. And then there's the Gettysburg uh, Hex Grid edition. Tactics 2 and Dispatcher are considered to be uh, collector's items. Uh, now, here's where I got in on the hobby. I got in here with U-Boat. That was my first game, 1969. Then came along Chancellorsville Civil War D-Day. I never did own Chancellorsville back in 68, 69, and I did not own Civil War. And I wasn't collecting uh, uh, sports games at that time. Again, this is the era I knew. A friend of mine had Bismarck, a friend had Waterloo, and another friend had Stalingrad. So these are the games that I grew up with in 69. Now, interesting that in this history of Avalon Hill, they do show here, the first time I've seen it advertised, is 1914 and the other game, Anzio. I'll read what it says here because it's kind of interesting. The games in this seventh group suffered by a combination of poor scale, complexity, and reasons described in length elsewhere. After a facelifting and an upscale new box design, Anzio muddles along to attract just enough devotees to guarantee its annual stay of execution. And they mention later that, yeah, uh, discontinued in 71, Guadalcanal in 72, 1914 in 1973. So 73 was the last year you could buy uh, copies from Avalon Hill of 1914. So it kind of vanishes off the earth after 73. And the uh, issue goes on to tell about the future of the company. If you can get yourself uh, a copy of this, this is very handy to get. I don't know how you'd get it today, but uh, this was one very nice magazine giving you the history of Avalon Hill. Now, why am I mentioning all this history of Avalon Hill and where the hobby was? Well, it's germane to the case of understanding the game itself. Now, in 1969, when this came out, as Avalon Hill admits in this uh, annual, that the game was rather complex for the time. And in many ways, it was ahead of its time. It was more complex than their other games, and I don't think it ever really caught on. And there was a lot of bad things about it. It also had some new innovations. One, for the first time ever, we had never seen double-sided counters. We take this for granted today. And that was quite novel for 1969, 68. Now, it also is a commentary on the state of the die cutting at the time. You can see that some of the counters are very offset on the flip side. And uh, the front, the numbers tended to be a little bit small, and even when you got a half-decent counter, sometimes um, they were not really centered. So that's a statement of the die cutting at the time. So innovation, double-sided counters, and this step reduction system. In other words, you had a 7-12-3, when it took a step loss, it became a 5-10-3, the 5-10-3 became a 4-9-3, and when it took a hit, it became a 2-7-3. Very simple and straightforward. But, uh, let me tell you, in 1969, and even today, this thing is a nightmare to set up. Now, here it is, over 50 years later, because I've got 50 years of gaming experience now, and uh, I've been trying to set this thing up, and it's a nightmare. To top it all and make it more embarrassing, there were several pages of errata, there was rule changes, and there was even mistakes on the unit counter chart. Not very many, mind you, but this thing was not easy to set up. So you've got 26 counters here, 13, 16 counters here, and then you put all the step reduction counters you could be easily an hour, an hour and a half setting this thing up. Now, you have to remember, again, the state of the hobby and how old we were, my generation, in 68, 69. Um, I was 18 years old, just finishing high school, and, uh, of course, living still at home. And I did not own this game in 68, 69. A friend did. So you can imagine our dilemma on a Saturday. Your friend comes over, you're going to play 1914. You try to set this thing up someone else's house. You've got this to set up. 
It takes a good hour, hour and a half maybe to set it up, maybe less. Then you start playing the game. And this game was a long game. There's lots going to it. And you'd play for hours, if you got that far. And uh, whatever it is, it's 5 o'clock in the afternoon. And your mother comes in and says, okay, we have to clear this table for supper. And that's it. You clear the table for supper. So, again, it's a product of its time. The people that were buying this um, were young and not living on their own, I think. And I think that's why it never really caught on. The net effect was that I played this one single time only, and we never uh, came back to it. I mean, why would you come back to it when you could, you know, set up uh, U-Boat or Bismarck or any of the old Avalon Hill games there, you know, Jutland, Bismarck, you know, play for a few hours and then uh, call it a day. But this one, we never got to finish. Now, I'll tell you some of the other things about the game that are kind of interesting that I only found out just weeks ago. Now here it is 2021, well over 50 years after this game came out, and I'm rediscovering it. I actually bought it on eBay just a few weeks ago. So I'm just looking at it now and trying to decide, is it this classic game that was way ahead of its time, or what's the final verdict here? Well, we'll get to that. Now Avalon Hill must have thought there was something wrong with 1914. Because less than a year later, um, a revision came out by Jim Dunnigan himself. And uh, it was signed by Jim Dunnigan, Revision Designer's Notes. And in it, he says something that I think is really amusing. I thought it was kind of cool. Um, he says here, As the game situation, World War I is pretty much a bust. Nothing happens, save for a lot of killing and expenditure of ammunition. Avalon Hill's game 1914 attempted to recreate the World War I situation in a game format. Unfortunately, they succeeded. Sure enough, the game soon degenerates into a stalemate. So, I thought that was kind of interesting. And that's signed by James, uh, Jane, uh, Jim Dunnigan, who later became president of SPI, as we know. Um, so, this revision kit, which I never uh, got, uh, I didn't even know its existence until a few weeks ago, I think it cost like a dollar or two dollars back in the Avalon Hill days. And you got a new set of counters and it was an entirely different game. Making it kind of like Stalingrad and some of the other simpler games were uh, de-eliminated, entire cores were destroyed. And we have proof of uh, the existence of that by on Board Game Geek someone posted this picture of the counters, which were just two numbers, six dash threes, a lot of those. And um, the Allies were 8-3s. So uh, the game did exist. It's selling for insane prices on eBay. Uh, I certainly am not interested in it. But for those of you who are already, apparently it's around, but uh, it's uh, mighty rare. If I have one beef about the game, it's certainly the setup time. I, I mentioned it's quite horrendous trying to get all the counters for the um, step reduction. And the setup, um, well, it was kind of nightmarish too. Although I like the open concept, it really wasn't my bag. What you got was a whole pad of these mobilization charts. The idea was that the allied player would mark down all the positions of his troops on paper first. The German would do the same. Then you'd compare the sheets and put the counters on the board. So you could explore other plans. You didn't have to necessarily follow the Schleifen plan. To add some spice to the game, they added these variation cards, whereby one side would choose a plan. Let's say the Allies chose this one here, card A8. Let's say the German charge chose this, card G6. And you would cross hatch these two cards on a table that appeared in the battle manual here and then this would give you some variable setups and variable victory conditions. So the game was set up to make the game alive and new and um, you know different every time you played it. The only thing that got me was I'm interested in history so I was interested in the historical setup so I'm not interested really in the plan whereby every single German core set up down here and nothing up here. 
The Schlieffen plan was studied for years. It was quite obvious to anyone that the Germans would be going through Belgium, uh, where they, of course, d did go through. So I was more interested in the historical setup. And unfortunately, this little four-page standard rules does not have the historical setup in it. Let's get to that. Now, in the last week or so, I've gone online to ask uh, veteran players of this game, you know, where's the historical setup? How do you set it up? I don't find it anywhere. And uh, I did find it myself in the battle manual, but they, they were very helpful. And uh, they told me, well, historical setup, if you want it, is right here in the manual. Okay, well, that's interesting. The French setup here, historical, and the French setup here, historical. So there you go, Gil. Set it up. Well, okay, that's great. Now I know why in 68 we couldn't set it up and why I had trouble setting up even now. Now I'll try to zoom in a little bit to show you. I mean, if anybody can decipher this chart, and the guys online were very good at helping me decipher it. But I had to take out, get some historical maps of World War I in color to show you the positions of the armies. Okay, I'll try to zoom in here. Okay, we're zoomed in a little bit there, and um, with the aid of the uh, order of battle, which they give you in the uh, manual, thank God they did that. Oh, right here, you get a complete order of battle for the uh, German army and the French army. And in the designer's notes, they state that there's been some compromises so that the counters aren't exactly like in the game. Okay, so we have to wade through that. But there's the plans to set up. Well, you know, I've had a hard time figuring this thing out. Now, I can read, it does say 4th Army. Great, 4th Army sets up in here. I guess, in this area. Um, what the nine means, no idea what it means. Um, I can see third army there, and I see fifth army here. But these other numbers, and CGX times nine, don't know what that means. Um, big circled area here with a bunch of, it looks like Gs or GTs, no idea what that means. There's no explanation anywhere of what all these figures mean. And if you try to set up some of the other scenarios, same thing. Like, wow, would have been nice to have a little explanation of what this stuff means. And reading the text here doesn't uh, help you at all. So that was my uh, main beef. The glossary of abbreviations is here on the last page of the battle manual. I would have thought that should be on the unit counter chart or in the standard rules, but it was not. And there's a good bibliography. And again, nowhere to be found is Jim Dunnigan's name in the actual credits. We take that for granted today that a lot of our uh, purchases are by designer. So it's uh, funny to see no credit for Jim Dunnigan in the actual game itself. Now, I later found out that there was a rata actually on the combat results table. Now, I purchased this game secondhand, so the fellow that owned it corrected the uh, errors. There was not that many. But it's, you know, you have a bit of a groan when the combat results table is wrong. And it shows the state of the art of the printing and the proofreading at the time, too. So he corrected these um, results. And I later found out through the correct errata that some of his errata has errata on it. So that was um, kind of useless for me to use this table. So I corrected it myself and... Uh, I believe that's the way the table should read. For you veterans out there, you might still recognize errors. I don't know. Anyway, I did play it. Did I play it to the end? No way. I played it for a few hours, solitaire. I did a setup. I just uh, took some historical maps, did the setup. And uh, this is not written in stone. Don't think for one minute that this is the actual historical setup. It is not. This is after I've played a few turns. Some counters are not in their positions. For the uh, video, I had to move counters around. So don't take this as, well, yeah, he's got the whole game set up wrong. Well, yeah, I've moved counters since then. And uh, we've had a bit of combat about around Liège and stuff like that. Now, uh, 
How does it play? Well, it, it plays just like Jim Dunnigan says it plays. It's World War I, all right. It's hard to get high odds, and no matter what odds you attack at, 5 to 1, 4 to 1, 3 to 1, it's usually a bloody stalemate, or the enemy loses one step. Plus, he can retreat um, or stay and take an extra loss. So it's World War One, all right. It's it's extremely stalemated, and it's a good simulation of World War One. Unfortunately, it's not much of a game, and uh, that's why I bought it. I said, well, I want a simulation of World War One. So be careful what you wish for. Sometimes you get it. And this is a simulation of World War I. Unfortunately, it's just not much fun as a game. It's not the kind of game you're going to set up with friends, play for several hours in the afternoon, and um, call it a day. You'd have to set this thing up for several sessions, and it's not really worth the time and effort. Because all you're really doing is just um, simulating World War I. In summary, then, where does 1914 stand in the uh, history of the hobby? Well, I caught an article online by somebody called JCB the Third. He doesn't give his full name, but the fellow obviously is versed in military history. He is a uh, Vietnam veteran, and he more or less concluded something. And I think I've reached the same conclusion. He, I'm paraphrasing, but he more or less concludes that. 1914, in the game hobby, was ahead of its time in the sense that the public wasn't really ready for such a complex game. I don't know how many copies were published. Eventually it was discontinued, as we found out. And um, I don't think it was a smash hit success. It just wasn't a very good game. But JCB the third concludes that it is a good simulation of World War I, and I've come to the same conclusion. So we agree there. It's a simulation of World War I, but it's just not that interesting as a game. And his final recommendation is, well, does he recommend you buy it? And he says, no, he does not recommend you buy it. He thinks it's for those aficionados of World War I, who have read on the topic extensively and just like it to study. And I think that's my conclusion too. I would not recommend trying to get an old copy of 1914 unless you have a particular interest in the subject. Now for me, the logical uh, replacement for 1914 is uh, Ted Racer's twin pack here, 1914 Glory's End, which covers the East Front, pretty well the same territory that 1914 is covering. And then uh, One Eagle's Fight, which covers the Eastern Front, the Battle of Tannenberg, which I'm also very interested in. So, uh, for me, this is the logical replacement for 1914. Now, since um, uh, I was doing a video on this, I don't even know if I released it, someone pointed out to me that there's another series called uh, Clash of Giants, which does this same campaign on a divisional level. And apparently that's a, a good game too, but... Um, I'm not really interested in exploring it on the division level. I'm quite happy with 1914 Glory's End and When Eagles Fight. So that's my conclusion of 1914. I hope the video is of some value. I just felt that 1914 needed a video. I don't think there is one on Board Game Geek or anywhere else that I can see. And this game is such a important game in the history of the hobby, I thought it deserved a video. So uh, that's my conclusions and uh, thank you for watching.